All right, let's go to Ephesians 3, please. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to read verse 11. The Bible says, According to the eternal purpose which he, that is God the Father, God, purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening, Lord. Uh, thank you for this chance for us to come together to learn more about thee and thy word. And Father, I ask that you fill us with the Holy Ghost as you illuminate us and teach us with regards to your eternal purpose. You know, you get, sometimes you have some burning, get some good questions, Lord. Uh, so I just pray you help us understand this. It is a big picture eternal truth and help me to be able to present this in a way that's befitting to thee, Lord, in accordance with your word and with your spirit. Um, and Lord, so please just take me out of the way so I can possibly give an idea of what you're getting at here. And we give you thanks and praise, Father, for really all things, but especially that salvation that you've brought through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And tonight we're going to look at God's eternal purpose for the ages. I get more questions sometimes, but this is actually a good one. This is, uh, I'd say it's big picture. To be honest, I think everybody here would probably un will get this when they hear it. They just never thought of it that way. So hopefully it's helpful to you. Because it seems so important that we're going to see that Paul sacrificed himself to be able to present it to us. So we see, we'll read this. Okay. And it really is the big picture truth. It's the reason why God even took the time to save you in the first place. Okay. So let's take a look at this. Go to Ephesians 3, please. We'll start in verse 1. We really need context to get any idea on this one. Okay. Ephesians 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Yeah. And so Paul says, hey, I'm a prisoner of Jesus in order to present something to you Gentiles. It's this mystery of some kind. Go to verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. So he's describing the mystery now. And of the same body and partakers of his promise, that's the promise of Christ, in Christ by the gospel, which, excuse me, the promise of the Father, which was done in Christ by the gospel, verse 7. Wherefore, I was made a minister. So he's telling us, what was the dispensation of grace that God gave to him to give to us? God gave him the grace to minister this mystery to us Gentiles. So this is actually the purpose to why Paul was called in the first place. God. This is why he's the apostle to the Gentiles, is to present this mystery more than anything else. Okay. Verse 7, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. See that? He was made a minister according to that grace. Verse 8, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints... And we should all think this way. It might help you grow in grace and knowledge, by the way. Okay. Is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ? And here we have one interesting item that he was given the grace to present to us, which is the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, what, what is that? Okay. Well, notice that it's unsearchable. That means if I look through the Bible, for example, I can't find that. I can't understand that just by looking at the Bible. It might require a little bit more because it's unsearchable. See? That's what, that's what it means. I can't go to Google and search for it. Okay? Give me an idea. And I can't do it in my eSword app either. That makes you wonder, well, what is this? Okay. Verse 9. It seems a little bit hard to believe, but that's what he was given to present. Okay, verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And here's his second point. 
the fellowship of the mystery. We'll finish the verse and then we'll come back to talk about that phrase. Which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Okay. So this mystery that he was sent to present to us was hidden in God. It's before, like it says right there, from the beginning. I should say not before. There is no before the beginning. That's a contradiction of terms. Okay. Give you an idea. From the beginning. And it was hidden in God. Okay. And he's called by the grace of God to give us this information. I said, what is this? Okay. So looking at the phrase again, the fellowship of the mystery. Notice in verse 6, we are fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise as God's in Christ by the gospel. So it's tied to being a fellow to that mystery. You see? A fellowship, many people think, you know, it's a communion of saints. We're fellowshipping right now, and that's true. But this fellowship is different. This is the actual word in its original definition. Okay? Like there are fellowships in which grad students provide funds in order to go to be a grad student. Okay? An organization with individuals that have roles in order to communicate an idea. Okay? Or to push forth to do something. That's what a fellowship is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, today, they famously talk about the Fellowship of the Ring because people like reading, you know, Tolkien's books and stuff, the Lord of the Rings and all that. That's what that was. It was a group of people who got together and said, we're going to protect this ring. Okay? That's what a fellowship is. See? And every single Christian here, yes, we have communion together, but we have a fellowship in this mystery specifically. So God, in his goodness from the beginning, planned this to where Paul would tell you how you can be part of the mystery and how to get in. Okay. Very important stuff. Just, just in case, let me bring it down for you. That's the gospel. Okay? But this is how God's eternal purpose is this high. Okay? It's, it's eternal. It's a big picture truth. Verse 10. To the intent that now... Okay, that's interesting. So what's going on now? To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, that's you, the manifold wisdom of God. So because you now have fellowship in that mystery Christian, there are principalities and powers in heavenly places that are witnessing the manifold wisdom of God through you. And the verse we read to start, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, God purposed that his manifold wisdom would come through those who have fellowship in the mystery. See that? A.K.A. the angels are learning from you. Isn't that weird? Yeah, they watch us. Okay? That's good and bad angels. They're in heavenly places too. They're spiritual witness in high places. And they ain't happy with y'all. Okay? If you learn anything about this ministry, you're gonna, or this mystery here, you're going to find out that the Lord's going to give you their spoils one day. Of course, that would bring them. That would get them a little mad. But that's part of this manifold wisdom of God. Okay, see, manifold, manifold. What does that mean? Okay. Manifold as an adjective means many, various. Okay. So God's wisdom has many facets to it. It's like looking at a diamond, okay? Has multiple facets. What makes it special as a jewel is the fact that it has these facets, right? There's multiple ways in which it can manifest the light that goes through it and makes it shiny and nice. It's the same thing with God's wisdom. It's manifold, it's great, okay? To bring it to the level of somebody who works in maintenance or in a factory, we have manifolds, water manifolds specifically. Okay? And there are a collection of pipes that organize and transfer water in many directions, even though all this is controlled by this one small section with a bunch of valves. They're very complicated if you don't know what you're looking at. But eventually, over time, as you learn, and I do this at work, okay, it becomes very simple to understand because you're growing in that knowledge and that wisdom. And God wants to manifest that wisdom to you. And through you, show that to these principalities and powers. So you can see manifold is an interesting word. And then there's the reality that manifolds are tied to the forms and shapes in mathematics. Is there a collection of a set of points in a plane? Let me put it in English. You got a triangle that's a 2D shape. That's a manifold of three sides. 
A pyramid is a three-dimensional manifold of, a, of an actual triangle. This is the idea here, okay? There's length, there's width, there's depth in this wisdom that God has to present to us. See? And right now, principalities and powers are witnessing this in our three dimensions. See? Manifold wisdom of God through the church, through you. Verse 12. Okay. Now we said, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, verse 12, in whom, in, this is in Christ Jesus, we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Now we talk about having access to the throne of grace and to come boldly. It's because of Jesus Christ that we can do this. See? And it's through those actions of your Christian walk that God's manifold wisdom can be manifest to these principalities and powers. So what is this mystery that's been hitting God? So maybe we should start there, right? Maybe we should think about that. Keep your finger here. Go to 1 Corinthians 2. Now, if you ever read 1 Corinthians, you'll find out that Paul describes a little bit of this, and then he says, I can't go any further. You're a bunch of babes. That's why the book of Ephesians, of Ephesians exists. That was him going further. See Ephesians were grown, they were mature, and they could hear about it. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 6, the Bible says, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. See, if you're a mature Christian, you can receive this wisdom. See, if it's perfect like your sinless, I guess none of us can, but that's obviously not true. Because God gave Paul a grace to give us this wisdom. He ob obviously, it's possible. But you have to be perfect in your walk. You have to be truly furnished on the good works. You have to be growing. You have to be a mature Christian. Verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. Amen. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. This sounds very similar. We just read it which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So this is another reason why he gave this purpose. He ordained it in such a way that it would be done to our glory because it would be through the church that this thing could be made manifold to others. Verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, including the devil. Okay. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now that's an interesting statement. We often talk about the devil wanting to kill Jesus. Do you think he would have wanted to if he knew that through the death of Christ he would save all of us? Are you kidding me? That's the last thing he wanted. But he didn't know. It was hidden to the devil. See? The idea that God would save sinners through the sacrifice of his son at Calvary. He would have never crucified the Lord of glory if he knew about it. See that? And that means there would be no body of Christ in which us Gentiles could be fellow heirs, you see? That's what the devil didn't know that. Okay, he had a lot of Bible knowledge in the sense that I'm sure you could recite Second Chronicles with no problem. But he had none of this. The Spirit of God doesn't give understanding to people who don't follow him, who don't know him. That includes Satan as well. He's not born again. Okay? It should be obvious, but people give Satan a little too much credit. You shouldn't do that. Okay? And if he did know, he would have never crucified the Lord. In fact, the Lord used that knowing that he would want to do that against him. And we've discussed that before when discussing the judgment of this world. That came because the son would go to Calvary. And he too, that prince, saying himself was judged there. Verse 9. So that's what this hidden mystery is. The idea that God would save sinners through Christ, in Christ Jesus. But as it is written, now we see this famous verse, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And we quote this verse talking about the new Jerusalem, talking about how amazing it's going to be over there. And you know what? It's going to be amazing. We've never seen or heard anything like that. But we just heard about things that are unsearchable in Christ as well. There are unsearchable riches in Christ Jesus that are included right here. Your eyes have never seen, nor ear heard. Neither have entered into your heart, not without God anyway, the things that God had prepared for you. So God had a plan. 
And he purposed eternally that through his son, and this mystery that he hid in himself, okay? And if you go to Hebrews 10, you'll find out that the word and the father, they had a conversation. He said, yes, I'll go do that. A body was prepared, you see? They hid that. And then they let things transpire in time to where we got to Calvary. See? They allowed people to make their free will choices knowing that they already had a plan to deal with all that. What a thing. Okay. This is what we mean when we say God is in control. This is what we're actually talking about. Okay. He's in control in ways that most people can't even grasp. But we're going to look at a little bit this evening. Go back to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. So now we know what this mystery was. It had to do with the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Jesus Christ dying for our sins. Okay? Saving us at Calvary through the free will choices of even his enemy. What a thing. <clears throat> and so Paul says in verse 13, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Now, this is interesting. Notice he says, wherefore. That goes back to everything he just said. Because I was given a grace to present this eternal purpose to you. See that? I pray that you Gentiles, including us, that we don't faint at his tribulations, at the sufferings that he received. These were the revelations for which he received a messenger. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Now you see the connection. What grace was he talking about? See that? There you go. And Paul is saying, look, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I exist to present this to you, and it's to your glory. Because we just read that the Lord had prepped it for our glory in 1 Corinthians 2. And Paul understood all these things. And Paul, a Jew, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, decided to give his life to make sure that we, us Gentiles, with all our different colors here this evening, could receive the gospel truth and everything else tied to that. Because we see it's greater than just that, but that's the beginning. That's the first seed. See? In fact, Ephesians itself is part of the eternal purpose of God. The fact that we're reading it this, month, this evening. Okay? <clears throat> what a thing. Okay? It was part of his grace that he even had the chance to present this to us. He took it as a very special blessing from God to be able to even have the opportunity. Is that how you think, Christian, when you're given the opportunity to simply give the gospel to someone? See? And so, verse 14, now let's keep looking here. For this cause, now you know what the cause is, that eternal purpose that he was given the grace to present, that mystery of Christ. For this cause, <clears throat> I bow my knees Unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now he's specifically talking about God the Father. See? Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, and the glory of God is Christ Jesus. So now you know whose riches it is. To be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. So the first thing that God wants to do for you in this eternal purpose is to make you a better Christian. Put it in English for you. This is why exhortation is so important. Okay. And so you see, you've been doing this all along without realizing it. But God had purposed that for you from, from the beginning. He wants every Christian to get stronger. To grow in grace and knowledge. You see that? Okay. <clears throat> Verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That's salvation. Now. That ye... Being rooted and grounded in love, because Jesus Christ is the love of God. You find it in Christ Jesus. See the connection? Yeah. May be able to comprehend with all saints. We're all supposed to know this. How come no Christian seems to have any concept of this? See? Part of the reason is they didn't actually believe what they were reading. Now, many people here, when you're hearing this, you're like, yes, that, that makes sense. I've never really thought about it, but... I get all this. This is, this is why I continue to come to church. This is why I continue to try to live for God. You already got this down. Just may have never heard it this way put together. Okay? Verse 18. May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length 
and depth and height. Okay? So now that you're rooted and grounded in Christ Jesus, who is the love of God, you should be able to comprehend these dimensions. That should bring up to your mind right now the manifold wisdom of God. Notice that. So remember, they ask this tied with dimensions. Many people think this is tied to the love of Christ or the size of the universe. Okay, you're kind of reading into the verse. You're not dealing with the context. And that, you know, go ahead, spiritualize it. That's fine. But if you really want to know what this is, you need to think about everything that Paul is saying. Okay? And he wants you to have fellowship in this mystery. So he wants you to know this manifold wisdom. Otherwise, how can you present it to somebody else? How can you say this is why God is so great? See? This is what we're discussing here. Why is God so great? Well, he saved me. Yeah, you're right. That is one of many reasons why he's so great. And that's probably the biggest one. That's the kernel here. That's the root, right? But there's so much more. He wants you to comprehend. Notice that. Not just hear about it. He wants you to comprehend it. He wants you to grab that and hold that and put it here and make it affect your walk. Okay? It's an exponential thing. Because as you comprehend these truths, your spirit of God will grow in your inner man and it'll manifest in your life. Comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, and depth, and height. 19. And to know the love of Christ. That's why I think they're, they're not tied together. Notice they're two separate items. Yeah. But notice he wants you to know it. Well, I do know it. I know Jesus, don't I? Yes. But the word know has many connotations. Okay. Paul knew Jesus Christ, and yet he said he wanted to know the fellowship of his sufferings, Philippians chapter 3. See? He wanted to know that. He wanted to partake of the power of the resurrection. That's what that's getting here. Because if you know the love of Christ, verse 19, the verse continues and says, which passeth knowledge. That's why it's unsearchable. Now you know it's unsearchable. See that? I can't find this concept of the love of Christ in here in the sense that I could just read it and get it. It needs to be experienced by living for God. See? Which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. And that's perfection. God wants to fill you with his fullness. God wants to communicate all there is about him to you. And Jesus Christ was in the bosom of the Father, wasn't he? He is the heart of God. So that's the goal here. The eternal purpose of God is tied to those two things. Okay? Manifesting the fellowship of the mystery through the manifold wisdom of God and helping you to partake of the love of Christ, partake of charity. That way you can experience some of those unsearchable riches in Christ because some things you can't get unless you experience them. You can't just read it out of a book. See? So let's look at those two things tonight. So we got two points and a billion subpoints this evening. That's all we got. Okay. Let's start with the manifold wisdom of God. Go to Romans 11. Keep your finger in Ephesians. Go to Romans 11, please. Have you ever read about the wisdom of God anywhere else? Well, there's been there's some other places. Okay. Big picture truths. God the Father planned it. The Son of God put it into practice. See that? Romans 11 and verse 25, we have a very interesting verse that's broken today. The Bible says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Notice that one mystery is actually tied to others. All the other mysteries are facets of the manifold wisdom of God of the mystery of Christ, including this one. Verse 25, Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And this mystery is ignored because we have many ignorant Gentile Christians who say the church has replaced Israel. They clearly do not understand the eternal purpose that God purposed for the ages. Because they totally forgot basically three quarters of the Bible. I mean, 39 books are dedicated to these people. There's no excuse. Especially when Paul is constantly quoting Old Testament during this entire section here. I'll get, I don't want to keep going. I'm going to sound all mean and stuff. Okay. 
But it's sad. And Paul directly tells us, don't be ignorant of that. Otherwise, you're wise in your own conceits. And yet we see this common today. What happened to the church? They must have lost sight of this reality of the eternal purpose of God. Okay? Choosing the flesh, choosing the things of this world and not the things that are above. And setting their affections there. Verse 28, continuing this context here. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. Talking about Israel. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes, because they still are God's chosen people, physically speaking. See? And God has a plan. If we, if we read the verses I skipped, you'd see that God will restore Israel one day. Read Revelation 19 for details. Verse 29. Why? For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. You would be negating a gift and calling of God by rejecting this truth. See? See, God is not a law. He doesn't abrogate and just ignore things. This is how you know, by the way. This is how you know that when you're saved, you're saved for good, too. Salvation is a gift from God, is it not? If you receive the gift of God, it's without repentance. So how can you sit there and say that you can just get rid of the gift? That doesn't even make sense. You didn't give it in the first place. You just received it. God isn't going to take that away from you. Who got into your ears? Who slithered in there and told you some lies? Okay. Verse 30. For as ye in times past, talking about us Gentiles, have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through there, that's the Jews' unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy, see that? They also may obtain mercy, because now we have Gentiles preaching the truth of the gospel to Jews. See that, friends? God gave mercy to Gentiles so where they can trust in Christ and be saved and receive grace. And then they can preach that in the rest of their life here on earth, because it's mercy for you to continue to be here, so that they may receive that same mercy when they make a decision with that gospel. Okay. And God did that through their unbelief. As a nation, they rejected Jesus Christ and God made a decision, okay, so I'm going to do this. Verse 32. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. What is that? What a thing. You figure God would just quit and say, well, it didn't work with the Gentiles of what happened. Okay, that's why I had to pick Abraham in the first place. We failed 2000, uh, those first 2,000 years. And then the Jews failed the next 2,000 years. Why didn't he just wipe us out, right? No. Was God just in, would he be just in doing that? Yeah. But he did it. He concluded them all, like it says, in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all and give us all the opportunity to find his son and partake of the mystery of Christ and be fellow heirs in that same body, Jews and Gentiles alike. There's the connection. This was all tied to God's manifold wisdom. He had a plan. He always planned for there to be a period to where Jew and Gentile alike could reach him. See that? And then you start seeing Paul just start praising God. Verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. See that? How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Once again, unsearchable. Isn't that weird? But you can read about this. What's going on there? Okay. You can't search God's mercy. It's something you experience in your life, whether you know it or not. See that? He might write it down. Yeah, my mercy endureth forever. Doesn't mean he has to practice it. That's what's going on there. Verse 34. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? The answer is no one. Rhetorical questions. Okay. Or who hath first given to him? And it shall be recompensed unto him again. Good question. And Paul is just praising God because he understood this manifold wisdom. And it blessed him to realize what God did. He chose to conserve us instead of destroy us. See? Well, how did he do this? We'll go to two places. Go to Galatians 3. Galatians 3 and 1 John 3. Galatians 3 and 1 John chapter 3.
1 John 3 and verse 8, the Bible says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, purpose again? For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. So why was Jesus Christ manifested? Verse 8, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And this was all tied to God's eternal purpose. His plan was, I'm going to allow the word to be made flesh and dwell among these men. In order for him to die for their sins. And through this work at Calvary that the devil himself would be celebrating and thinking he got victory over me over. And through this death, I'm going to bring life. And through this death, I'm going to destroy all his works, including the people who commit sin. You see? Because he was the first one to do it. He was a murderer from the beginning. And Christian, when you got saved, he destroyed that old man in you, which was a work of the devil. It got crucified, Romans 6. Yeah, I get that it still bugs you sometimes, but that's usually your choice. Yeah. See? But God's going to wipe that out from you forever. And he already divorced it from your soul, saving you from your sin. So now you're seeing how all this stuff ties together. See? When God the Father purposed it, he talked to the world, and the world was like, yes, I'll do this. And that was the purpose that was done from the beginning against what the devil would do later. You see? And this is why now Jews and Gentiles both have mercy from God in order to, Galatians 3 and verse 22, and dots here. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. That's why you have mercy. So you can make the choice to believe on Jesus Christ and receive his grace. To become a fellow heir in the body of Christ. To have fellowship in that mystery. See the manifold wisdom of God? See that? And everything else, the Lord's life, the Lord's death, the Lord's resurrection, the Lord presenting all these epistles to the brethren to give to us. All these things are facets of that manifold wisdom that God the Father had planned okay, in the beginning. So everything we focus on is actually just one little facet of the big, the big jewel that is this purpose. See? So what does that mean? Okay? Well, let, me, let me put it like this, and I'll give you some examples here. Remember when you were a kid? Yeah. And you had some toys. You know, I had these little wrestling toys, right? And his, his arm popped off. It broke off. And I was like, man, this thing doesn't work no more. And you know what the first thing that came to my mind was? I'm throwing this out and getting another one. You know what you did as a kid? This doesn't work for me right in the trash. See? That's not how God thinks. God thinks like an adult. Okay? Because when I, I was throwing the trash, all of a sudden my dad grabs it and he puts it back in. He says, look, you can fix it. And he tries to show me how to fix it, how to remedy it, to conserve the toy. See? God did the same thing. God said, yes, I have a plan for this universe. I have a plan for my creation, but I don't just want to destroy it. I want to conserve it. How do I do this? That's what the eternal purpose is. And unlike us adults, where we try to fix things and sometimes we just can't do it. God, God is 100% on the money all the time. Okay? And so this process goes, and now I'm going to give you a little illustration to see what's going on with God and the devil. Okay? And think of a teacher who's teaching a class. I'm teaching, you know, uh, algebra. Remember, remember uh, algebra is really complex for a lot of kids, right? And man, what is this? Let's jump from 8th to ninth grade. I don't get this. And the teacher's trying to explain algebra and how it works. And you got that little, that little snarky, arrogant, super smart kid in the back. Whisper into it, like, hey man, this is all this is all Mickey Mouse, man. I can handle this. It's all a joke. And the teacher's the teacher's teaching, but knows that this kid is talking all this mess in the back. Yeah. And the teacher's like, okay. I heard that you can solve this problem. Let me give you a problem. You come up to the board and you show us your way of solving it, and we'll see how far you go. And so the teacher allows the student to come up, and the student is going over there trying to give his grand opus, explaining why it's all right, and he tries to solve the problem, and he has an error here. And he has an error there. And he has an error here. And he has an error there. And the teacher stands back and just allows this to happen, hoping to see if the kids in the group are going to point out, no, you, you messed up there. You didn't add right here. 
Because if there's any kids that do that, they're paying attention to the teacher and what the teacher said, right? And so this continues until the point where that student finally admits, I can't do this. I can't solve this problem. Why'd you give me this complicated problem? And she was like, well, it's the same problem. It's algebra. It's not my fault that with all your genius, you couldn't take care of business. Let me show you how to properly do this. And the, the student goes back to the seat all, all ashamed, right? Because he failed. And then the teacher reaps the spoils so that the students around in that class finally recognize who they should be following as far as solving this problem. This is God and the devil. Because God had a plan and the devil said, I could do it better. And he was whispering in the back with all his principality and power buddies. Hey, all we got to do is break the word. That's all we got to do. We'll get God to compromise with us. The Lord said, really? All right. And he got judged, we know that. Next thing you know, God creates Adam and Eve. And then the devil deceives them, and then God says, okay, you're the God of this world now. You've earned the legal right. Go ahead and do it. And what did the devil do? He ran it straight to the ground. But God in his goodness came in to that same world with the devil's rules and beat him in his own game. No problem. See? And any single person who recognizes God's work and comes to him for salvation is free from that world. They're free from that problem. It's the same idea. See? Except this is the eternal teacher we're talking about. Another level. Okay? And not only that, God's going to conserve every person who recognizes that. It's not just, oh, you're going to get an A on your test, your math test. You're going to get an A on life and live eternally. It's a bigger deal. See? And that's the manifold wisdom of God to where other principalities and powers saw this. And every time they look at you, Christian, they see someone who figured it out and that gets them mad. They don't like that. And every single principality and power that stayed with God, they're blessed by it. They're like, wow, I can't believe that God could turn somebody sat vile and that disgusting to him in this way and conserve him forever. See? Because we are vile. Paul said he was wretched. He thought of that. He thought of himself that way. And yet God can conserve us despite our failures. Praise God. And what should that result in? That's a good question. That gets into the love of Christ. Go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Just to point out, notice the manifold wisdom we could search for. I could read about it and just explain it using the Bible. That's all I have. I can do that. That's possible by the Spirit of God and the word he gave to us. But this is different. Ephesians 4 and verse 11, talking about charity, the love of Christ, the Bible says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the, uh, the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. This is why some brethren have specific gifts of the Spirit to do these things. It's so that we can edify the body and help them grow into what? 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. You see, to know the love of Christ. Unto a perfect man. Unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. And that was the idea. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that we might uh, have the fullness of God. Something to that extent. It says in Ephesians 3. See that? What is the fullness of God? Colossians 3 and verse 14 says that charity is the bond of perfectness. There you go. Love in action. I notice that. Love in action. You have to live it. I can read about it, but if I don't practice it in my life and surrender to God, I'll never understand why it's so vital. <coughs> See, it's unsearchable in that way. There are many people who, in their head, talk about the love of Christ and all this amazing, and yet they have no testimony whatsoever. They have no concept of the love of Christ. They've never went out and tried to reach somebody for Christ. Just like Christ came out and reached to us. Because part of destroying the works of the devil required God to come down and work with each and every one of us. 
God's eternal purpose is to make Christ dwell in your heart by faith. Did we not read that? But in all ways. That's what it means to be a Christian, a little Christ. And yet we have many Christians today who don't even understand that. What's going on? Okay. Go to John 13. John 13. So let's search the Bible for instances where the love of Christ is mentioned and think about how we truly get to experience that in our lives. This is all part of God's work. John 13 and verse 34, the Bible says, a new commandment I give unto you, and he gave it to those who had believed on him. So you've done the first portion of this new commandment. We're going to look at the second. That ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And that, that's the key. And God commands it, but will you actually do it? See? God tells you it, but you have no idea of what that means until you live it. Until you sacrifice for another brother or another person. See? You won't understand this just by reading about it. You have to make the choice to live for God. So what does this look like? Well, it starts with the brethren like we see here. Go to Galatians 6. I'll give you some examples of possibilities. <coughs> Salud. Galatians 6 and verse 1. The Bible says, <coughs> Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself that thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill, see, fulfill, Fullness, fulfill the law of Christ. I like English. You can do that stuff. <laughs> See that? So part of manifesting charity, Christian, in your life is to bear the burdens for the brethren. Pray for them. Try to help them grow. If you know they're in a fall, consider that. Do your best to help them bear without ruining yourself in the process, like it says there. Okay? So you do that individually with brethren. What about your local church? 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Paul was writing to a local church at Corinth here. And he was hoping that they would grow out of their childish divisions, you see, and become perfect. What's the bond of perfectness? 1 Corinthians 13. This is like, I know all this stuff, man. <laughs> exactly. God purposed it. The Son put it in a reality for us to live out. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 8, the Bible says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, charity, then that which is in part shall be done away. And now he gets into an illustration. Why is this here? Think about Corinthians. He called them all babes because they were fighting. <laughs> When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, when I grew up, I put away childish things. Comparison time. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. We see darkly as children, we don't really understand things, and we fight and we bicker, see? But then when we manifest that which is perfect, face to face. Now I know in part, that, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Because faith you can search out in the Bible and get. Hope you can search out in the Bible and get. But charity you can only experience. You got to manifest that in your life. That manifold wisdom has to take shape and become a full image from glory to glory in your Christian walk. See? Is it just to the brethren? Well, it should start there. But there's more. The Lord gives us the next level in Matthew 5. Go to Matthew 5. So now we see the brethren in our local churches. What else? Matthew 5 and verse 43. The Lord in the Sermon on the Mount brings up the levels, the spiritual levels of these things with the Jewish people. And he says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, 
Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that, ha that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Well, I, I do that all the time because you're walking with God. See, God told you, but until you actually deal with persecution, you won't understand how hard that is to do. Those are just words. See? The riches come when you put it into practice. And you see how God can give joy in your heart, not just happiness, joy which is eternal and full of glory. See that? 45. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Interesting. Okay. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which, uh, which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect. There it is again. Even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Perfection results in you giving good to those who do right and wrong against you. Loving them. Who despitefully use you see and through Christ that can happen to you Christian and you can experience and know that love of Christ so much so that the godly in Christ Jesus we know shall suffer persecution you'll choose to live for God despite knowing that the world's gonna be against you that the world's gonna hate you and the world's not gonna like you and you choose to do it anyway because you know it's for their good not just your own that's what love is. Sacrifice. Giving when nobody else would. And God did it first with his son. And his purpose is that we would understand that in our lives. See? Go to 1 John 4. 1 John 4. First John 4, we're going to look at verse 16. I kind of looked at this a bit this morning, but I'm going to read some more here. The Bible says, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. Amen. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. What? Yeah, when the world is judging you, you have boldness to speak regardless. That's actually love. You won't understand that till you do it. And let the Spirit work in your inner man so it can grow and give you power. See, Because as he is, Jesus, God, so are we in this world. Now we quote this verse a lot, but now you're seeing the context. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Not the fear of God, the fear of men, the fear of the devil. Some people go too far and say the, the fear of God is good. It's the beginning of wisdom. That's never bad. <laughs> it's never bad to get on your knees in front of God. That's actually the best way to get any power is to go straight to God himself and ask him to help you, knowing your own frailty. See? There is no love in fear, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. The fear of God doesn't have any torment. See that? It doesn't even make sense. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. And that's the, pro the trouble with Laodicea saying Christianity right there. They're too busy fearing men and they're caught up in snares. They can't even understand this perfection or come close to it. They won't let God, let his love be manifest in their lives. It's a sad thing. Thank God they will eventually in the millennium as we were talking about in prayer meeting this, this evening. They're going to get their chance. Amen, brother? Amen. Amen. Thank God for that. His purpose will be completed. It may not happen in this life. It's going to happen. God is 100% on the money. Didn't I just say that? He don't fail. Okay. He'll work his work in us one way or another. Hopefully you choose to figure that out today and you get some rewards for it. Praise the Lord. Okay. And then the highest level of this is John 15 verse 13, which talks about uh, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Greatest love is willing to sacrifice your life for others, whether they love you or they don't. And Jesus Christ, see that? He sacrificed his life for us when we were still his enemies. He's the greatest manifestation of this. But are there any people who actually felt this way 
And I'm not just talking about physical death. Okay? I'm talking about your soul. I'm talking about who you are. His soul was made an offering for sin. Are there any examples of this in the Bible? Go to Romans 9. Amen. Amen, Pastor. Romans 9 and verse 1. We'll start there since we're in the New Testament. And you might say, well, well why did Paul get this grace? What makes him so special? Nothing. He'll even tell you. He ain't special. He did choose to listen to God, though. Romans 9 and verse 1. Nothing special about that. That's called doing right. Notice what he wrote here. Romans 9 and verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Now, why did God allow all this to be written? He wants to make sure we understand that he is not lying here. Because this, this is going to sound incredible. This is going to sound like a supernatural thing. And it is. This is knowing the love of Christ. Verse 2. That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites. You know what he said there? I wish I can go to hell so they can all be saved. For eternity. That's what he said. Can you do that? I ain't there. I'll be the first to tell you. I need some grace. I'm trying to grow. But there may be somebody you might be there for. I don't know. The Lord knows. And he'll help you have that grace when that time comes. And that's really how Paul felt. That's knowing the love of Christ. That's partaking of the fullness of God. See that? And we read about this, but we know he really felt this way. If you read Acts and saw everything he did with his people, it's incredible. How much he tried. How he let them stone him and all these things. And he died and came back. Okay? And there are many Christians today and throughout history who are willing to sacrifice their lives to get the gospel up. That should include you. You're like, you should be a living sacrifice unto God. You are sacrificing your life even if you don't have a gun to your head. But if that time comes, may the Lord give you the grace to practice this. Who else? Okay, Pastor mentioned it. Exodus 32. He just whispered it. And this is why these men are great examples of Jesus Christ. They were fulfilling God's eternal purpose in their lives. He knew they weren't sinless. But he knew he could get his will done and they could be just like him one day. And these men attained it in their lives. Exodus 32 and verse 30, the Bible says. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. He says, let me go and try to intercede for you. Does that sound familiar? Who did that? Yes. Amen. Verse 31. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, Blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. There it is. He said, Lord, take me out of your book of life. Allow me to die in their place. And he really meant that. And that's why the Lord responded, verse 33. And the Lord said unto Moses, Now, whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. He gave him a very slight reproof, saying, That's not how it works. But I recognize what you're trying to do here. Okay? And he had a plan. And this is why if you keep reading, you're going to see he's going to show something. He's going to show his angel. Why did he show it? To let him know that, yes, one day I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to do exactly what you wanted to do, and it will have eternal meaning. Because my son will never sin, unlike you. And he'll save you and save everyone. That's how the Lord gave him a grace here, to even see Jesus like that. Think about that. You want to see Jesus? He did. I want to see him, but I'm not going to get that for quite a while. But I, one day I will. Okay? What a thing. Okay? I think it was in Exodus 34 is when that actually happens, or 33? Yep, 33. It says in verse uh, Exodus 33 and verse 19, And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. So who's the goodness of God? Jesus. Who's the name of the Lord? Jesus. There you go. 
And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will have mercy on whom I will show mercy. Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And we know that. That's why you got to see. The Lord granting him in accordance with his choice, let the love of Christ manifest. And let me show you my eternal purpose. See that? This wisdom is for those that are perfect. Are you perfect, Christian? Because if you are, okay, no, you won't be sinless, but you'll want to live for God. That's, that's basically what this boils down to. You won't need the person in the pulpit reminding you to live for God. You won't need him to call you during the week. Because you'll be wanting to live for God every day. Every minute. Every hour. Every second. Is that you? Is that? If it is, God's eternal purpose can be manifest in you. To where the principalities and powers will learn something. Will you allow that to happen? And so to conclude Ephesians 3, let's go back. We'll conclude right here. Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3 and verse 20. And we'll conclude just with what Paul says here because now you understand what he's saying. Verse 20. Now unto him, that is God, that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Amen and amen. Uh, Pastor, do you mind closing us in prayer? Sir? Thank you, Father, for the teaching.